Yes, indeed. Well, good morning. Good morning. Some of you can hear me. Happy Mother's Day. It is wonderful to see so many of our mothers here this morning. Uh, I hope that you had a sweet time of celebrating with family this morning as you celebrated, yeah, just the goodness of God's gift to us in mothers. It's really a, a sweet thing to remember that the Lord blesses us with moms who look after us. And so if you're a mother, uh, well, we just say happy Mother's Day to you. We hope it's a wonderful day for you. Uh, also, if you're here this morning and uh, you are a guest with us, we're very glad you're here. Uh, if you look on the, the chair back in front of you, you'll see a little card there. That's a guest card. We would love, it, if you would, fill that out for us and let us get to know you a little bit. You could uh, write down your name, information. Also, if there's any way we can pray for you this week, we would love to do that. You could fill that out as well. Uh, and then at the end of the service, you could give it to myself or, or uh, really anyone around you. But anyone by the door in particular would be able to take those from you. If you prefer technology, there's also a QR code on the back of your bulletin that you received when you came through. You can use your phone to scan that, and it'll take you to a form that you can fill out online. We would love to have you do that so we can get to know you. After the service this morning, as we always do, there'll be a time of fellowship. There are folks that are outside. There are folks that are inside. And by God's grace, in, in not too many more weeks from now, that won't be the case because we will be in a new building. And... So if you're visiting with us this morning, just know that you're in the midst of a group of very happy people whom the Lord has blessed very richly. The video that we were showing just a minute ago is that the building uh, there on Ironbound Road that the Lord has provided for us, and we continue to rejoice in that. Christ Fellowship, in your bulletin this morning, you will find several announcements of things that are happening in the life of the church. Uh, definitely do take a look at that so you can keep up to date with what's happening here. And we also want to celebrate God's goodness to our church uh, because the Lord helped us to, I really think, uh, by His grace, do an amazing job in terms of raising funds for CareNet for their Walk for Life. CareNet is a crisis pregnancy center down in Newport News that we have supported for years and years. And by God's grace, we were the top team again in terms of raising support. We raised over $15,000 to support that ministry. So, yeah. so praise God for that. All of that money will be used for good gospel ministry and serving moms and saving babies. Now let's do this. Let's prepare our hearts for worship. We're going to take a moment just to kind of quiet our hearts. It's very easy to come to church and just the busyness of the week is with us. So let's take a moment to quiet our hearts before the Lord and get ready to worship him, to declare his worth and to praise him together. And then after that moment of silence, I'm going to call us to worship from Lamentations chapter 3. Lamentations 3, verse 22 to 23. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's pray. Oh, Lord God, you are great and greatly to be praised, and we praise you this morning for your faithfulness, that you are a God of steadfast love, and that you have met us through the gospel with endless, perfect love. We praise you that we gather together this morning clothed in the righteousness of Christ. We praise you that we gather together this morning perfectly accepted in him. And it's on our hearts this morning to praise you, to worship you. Lord, we want to sing songs of praise to you this morning with joy. Uh, Lord, we want to sing and worship you this morning the way we're going to do in heaven when we see you face to face. So would you come and would you empower our praises this morning as we read your scripture, as we pray, as we sing together, as we as we hear your word proclaimed, as we see a picture of the gospel, as our brother BJ is baptized this morning, God, please be with us and be worshiped in this time, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Christ Fellowship, our God is a God of steadfast love. He is faithful. He's a God who has saved us. He is a God who is worthy of praise. So let's stand together. Let's worship our God together by singing out joyfully as we sing Psalm 150 and come behold the wondrous mystery.
26, verses 25 through 34, followed by a prayer of confession with Bryce Rader. Matthew 6, 25 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow was thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is the word of the Lord. We now come to the part in our service where we confess our sins before God. And I want you to hear me that we are God's family. And us being his family, he desires that we come to him. He desires that we confess our sins to him. And us being his family, he will meet us in gentleness and love. So let's go before him now confessing our sins. Father, we come before you confessing that we can be a prideful people. We can, people. we can be a people who take a lot of pleasure in ourselves. We can be a people who always want to draw attention to ourselves. And we can be a people who work to exalt ourselves before others. God, some of us desperately desire to be known that we are intelligent people. So we speak in a way that brings attention to our brilliance. A few of us want to be seen very successful in the eyes of others. And so the bulk of our conversations, they really center around our accomplishments. A couple of us want to boast in our looks, and we constantly find pleasure when we compare ourselves to others. God, some parents in here take prideful pleasure in their children's accomplishments and behaviors. We are quick to point out and criticize other parents who seem to be struggling with their children. God, some healthy people find their self-worth in their bodies and can internally look down on those who are not in the best condition. God, we can quickly move into a place where we're constantly comparing ourselves to others and trying to make ourselves look better before others. And God, in doing this, we confess that we turn inward we turn to selfishness and pridefulness as we boast in ourselves. God, we are constantly fighting against our pride. And so we ask that you might kill our prideful flesh. God, we pray that you would renew a right spirit in us. Help us have a correct view of ourselves. Yet above all, God, we ask that you would help us grasp the truth that everything we have comes from you and everything we have is for you. God, I pray that you would help us understand that the gifts that you've given us are for your glory. It is to exalt you. It's not to exalt ourselves. God, kill the prideful flesh that wants to say, let us increase. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Hear the good news for prideful people provided by our God of grace. But God proves his own love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
How much more then, since we have now been justified by his blood, will we be saved through him from wrath? That is a promise for us. Because Christ has died, we are justified, that we are saved from his wrath. Well, I love our next song, Oh Great God. The final lyrics of the song, you kind of see the song, it's like a progression of the Christian life, and the final lyrics kind of give evidence of those that have kind of matured and are now really um, a mature Christian. You see the lyrics of the very final verse. You are worthy to be praised with my every thought and deed. O great God of highest heaven, glorify your name through me. Although that is our desire in various degrees, I pray that we as a congregation would grow more and more that we can confess that we want to glorify God with everything that we have, that we want his name exalted through us. So as we stand and sing that song, I pray that we plead with God that he would make this a reality in our lives. Let's stand and sing. Matthew 6 tells us not to be anxious for tomorrow since our Heavenly Father knows all of our needs and He knows them better than we do. Philippians 4 also tells us not to be anxious for anything but to bring our petitions to God with supplication and thanksgiving. Let's thank our God now and acknowledge His trustworthiness by singing, O Great God.
Sending true speakers are excused. Well, if you've been following the Lord for any period of time, you know that the hope in the Christian life is not found within us. It's not found in our power, our ability to serve the Lord the right way. The hope is found in Jesus Christ who lives his life through us. He is our great high priest, and he's the one that we can go to to pray, uh, to praise him, to ask for his help. So let's do that now. Let's, let's pray as we approach our God. Lord God, what a joy it is again to come into your presence as your people. Lord, we want to praise you this morning, and there's so many reasons to praise you. Lord, we praise you this morning as our great provider. Lord, we acknowledge with joy in our hearts that all we have 
every good gift, every perfect gift comes down from you. Lord, we lack nothing. And we lack nothing because you are generous. Uh, Your provision for us is bountiful. And we've experienced that even this past week. Lord, we praise you for the gift of grace. Lord, we praise you for spiritual strength. We praise you for healing us. Lord, we praise you for forgiveness for all of our failures. We praise you for open arms that receive us when we, when we stumble and fall but get up and come to you again. We praise you for providing us with food and clothing and shelter. Lord, we praise you for providing us with, with our families. Lord, we praise you for providing us with a spiritual family. You know, Lord, the local church where we can gather as brothers and sisters and worship you together and live life together. But most of all, we praise you this morning for the gift of your son who gave himself for us. Oh, Lord, you made your love known to us and that you gave your son. Lord, we praise you for that matchless gift. And we thank you that because of that matchless gift, we really live in the environment of the gospel. We praise you that, that even now we stand before you perfectly accepted and beloved and that the enemy cannot accuse us because every time he tries to accuse us, Christ stands up, our intercessor, and says, he belongs to me, she belongs to me. And so we are covered, and we praise you for this. Lord, we thank you so much for the hope of the gospel. It is amazing to think that because you have poured out all of your wrath on Jesus, there is no wrath left for us. Lord, we so often believe Satan's lies that when we sin, or when we fail, or when we don't serve you the way we should, that you're dissatisfied with us, that you kind of cross your arms and look look at us, and Lord, you're disgusted by us and nothing could be further from the truth. Lord, you are at work in us by your Spirit, and you tell us that that you who began a good work will be faithful to complete it. And so we thank you this morning that because of the gospel, Lord, you will complete that good work, and you will do that work in us by your Spirit, making us more and more like Jesus. We long to be righteous as Christ is. We thank you even now that we have that position given to us as a gift before you, and we praise you that the day is coming when we see you face to face, when we will be like you, when we will be perfectly righteous. Thank you, Lord God, for these wonderful gifts. Lord, we pray this morning for the nations of the world. Lord, we praise you for the way that you're working out your sovereign purposes among all nations. We thank you this morning for the nation of Ecuador. We pray for this nation with 18 million people. It's a a nation that needs financial and political stability. But it's also a nation that has known an outpouring of your spirit and many thousands of people coming to faith in Christ in recent decades. We thank you that our brother Fernando Mogravejo is one of those. Uh, Lord, just a, a precious part of our church, but he was saved there by the work that you're doing in Ecuador. And we're praying, Lord God, that you would continue to do that good work, that you'd be building up local churches all throughout Ecuador, that you'd provide them with faithful pastors, that you'd cause gospel growth to occur all throughout that nation. Lord, we want to thank you in a special way for the mothers that you've given us as we celebrate Mother's Day today. And Lord, I want to pray in particular for the mothers of our church. I want to pray that they would be encouraged today. Uh, Lord, it's easy for mothers to look, to look at themselves and wonder if they're doing a good job. Lord, what grace we've received from our mothers. We pray that they would be encouraged. We pray that they would be strengthened. We pray that they would, would be blessed today as we have the opportunity of celebrating them and the sacrifices that they have made for us. Lord, we pray that the mothers among us would would receive fresh strength from you today to continue to serve. And and some of the children are full-grown and have children or even grandchildren of their own, and yet these mothers will continue to mother all the way to the end, and I pray that you give them great grace to do that. Lord, we thank you that we can praise you for so many things. Lord, we praise you this morning that Matt and Haley have reported that they've been able to, to purchase a new building for the Language Center in North Africa a better place that will allow for more students and will allow your gospel to go forward. We praise you for that. And we pray that you'd continue to provide for a brother and sister and those working with them as they seek to make your name famous all throughout North Africa. Oh God, we praise you so much for this new church building. Lord, we thank you that you've seen fit to answer years of prayer uh, and many, many, many hours of effort. And Lord, you've done it in such a way that we just have to sit back and say, God did this. There's no way we can take credit for it. Lord, you dropped it out of the sky, as it were, for this church. And so we bless your name and we praise you. Oh, Lord, it was right for us to try our best and to do all that we could. 
And yet we have been stunned and amazed that you have provided so well, Lord, and in a way that shows that you are glorious. Lord, we pray that you would help us as we transition to that building in coming weeks. Uh, Lord, there will be a lot of work to do. Lord, would you strengthen us as a church to do that together? Uh, Lord, would you give wisdom to the elders and to Dick Quirin, who's going to be helping us coordinate that project? Would you give great wisdom as we seek to, to put things in order so that there would be an orderly transition? And God, would you keep Satan from spreading disunity in our church and complaining? As I'm sure that there will be challenges as we do this, God, we want to do this together in a way that brings honor and praise to you. Lord, we thank you for those that you've raised up in our church to serve us. We thank you for Terry Lackey this morning. As our deacon of facilities who continues to minister and the strength that you provide, give our brother great grace as he, as he helps us and cares for us. And even now as we take on a new facility, Lord, give our brother great strength uh, as he helps us with that ministry. Lord, we thank you for Christian Guarino and the good work that she does as our hospitality coordinator. We pray that you would encourage her today and Andrew as well. Lord, we pray that they would know that you are pleased with them in Christ. And we pray that she would have fresh strength to continue to serve you. And Lord, we pray for our church as we think about the fact that you have saved us and given us the mission of making disciples. Lord, we're praying that you would continue to grow in our church a culture of evangelism, where we're sharing the gospel, where we're praying for the lost. Lord, where we're seeking to, to bring them to where they can hear the gospel and where we're working together to see men and women and boys and girls, girls come to know you. And Father, Lord, finally, in light of the, the passage we're going to be studying together this morning, would you help us to be a church that is characterized by gratitude? God, I pray that we would be a thankful people. I pray that we would look at your continual provision and we would just put our hands across our mouth if we're ever tempted to complain because you have been so good to us. Do that good work in us as we study your word. Help us, God. Come and be our teacher by your spirit, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please take your copy of God's word and turn with me, if you would, to Exodus we're continuing our study in the book of Exodus this morning, and we're looking at Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, all the way to chapter 16, verse 35. There's a lot of content. I'm just going to read that first section for us as we jump into God's Word together. Let me read Exodus 15, verse 22 to verse 27, and I'd ask you if you would to stand with me out of respect for God's Word while I read this portion of Scripture for us. Exodus 15, verse 22. Then Moses led Israel on from the Red Sea, and they went out to the wilderness of Shur, and they journeyed for three days in the wilderness without finding water. They came to Marah, but they could not drink the water at Marah because it was bitter. That is why it was named Marah. The people grumbled to Moses, what are we going to drink? So he cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, and when he threw it into the water, the water became drinkable. The Lord made a statue, an ordinance for them at Marah, and he tested them there. He said, if you will carefully obey the Lord your God, do what is right in his sight, pay attention to his commands and keep all his statutes, I will not inflict any illnesses on you that I inflicted on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Then they came to Elim, where there were 12 springs and 70 date palms, and they camped there by the water. Please be seated. This is God's word for us this morning, and thank God for his word. Christ Fellowship, does God provide for His people? He does. Four weeks ago, and again, if you're visiting with us, we're just celebrating because God's been so good to us. But four weeks ago, we were looking at building a 12,000 square foot building. It was a project that would cost, we were told, something like $7.2 million or $600 per square foot. And I think many of us felt that it was difficult to kind of be excited about the project because we wondered if it was a good stewardship of God's resources and yet we knew we had a real need. We needed space. And so with no other option that we could see, we were committed to moving forward and doing the best we could, and we were going to trust God to help us, but we had no idea how we were going to be able to do it. But then, praise God, three weeks ago, God provided. Upward Church Building, I think it's the first church building in the last 10 years that's come on up for like sale in Williamsburg. Uh, that church just happened to call our realtor who called us and let us know about the opportunity. And then after a bit of back and forth bidding between us and another local congregation, our best and final offer was accepted. And last week, by God's grace, our congregation overwhelmingly voted 
to purchase, to acquire that new church building with its 20,000 square feet of space, a full court basketball gym, <laughs> kitchen, children's ministry space, 4.6 acres of land, AV equipment and furnishings worth hundreds of thousands of dollars. Praise God. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Right? It is good and right for us to praise God for his provision because our God is a God who provides for his people. And we as a church, we just experienced that, and it is right for us to celebrate and praise God for that. So we can say yes, absolutely. And when you look at this passage, what you see in this passage that we're studying this morning is God's provision. Here you see in God's word, so that you can see it with your own eyes, the fact, the proof that our God provides for his people. And you see it in the way that he provided for the people of Israel when they found themselves in the wilderness without water and without sufficient food. How are they going to survive? Our God is going to provide for them day by day for 40 years in the wilderness. Our God provides for his people. This is a sweet passage of scripture because it addresses one of the fundamental fears that we face as those who follow Jesus. And listen, some of us face it more than others. And it's the fear of, will we have enough? Will God provide? For some of us, that question rests on us hard. And we find that we do not have rest in our souls the way we should have rest in our souls because we're constantly wondering, am I going to have enough? Is the day finally going to come when we don't have what we need? Well, this passage is a passage that teaches us to say, yes, our God will provide for all of our needs according to his riches and glory. It's a passage that sets us free from worry and doubt. It's a passage that sets us free from grumbling and complaining. Because here we're going to see the people of Israel, they grumbled and complained, and they did not trust in the Lord. And yet God in his kindness, he still provided for all of their needs because our God is gracious. So we're continuing our study in the book of Exodus. Two weeks ago, we looked at Exodus chapter 15, verses 1 to 21. That's the song of Moses. And we saw how Moses and Miriam both led the people of God in joyful songs of praise to God because God had just rescued them by destroying the army of Pharaoh and drowning them in the Red Sea. And as we looked at that passage, we were reminded that we should joyfully praise God for the far greater salvation that we've received. We've received a far greater salvation in Jesus Christ, and so it's only right for us to respond to that salvation with joyful songs of praise. And as we worship our God corporately together as a church, we would praise Him with expressive joy. Uh, we should praise Him now the way we intend to praise Him when we see Him face-to-face -face in heaven. And I've got to tell you, I can't wait for that first Sunday when we don't have an eight-foot drop tile ceiling above us, but we have room to just sing out and praise our God. There's so much to give thanks for. Now, in this passage that we're studying this morning, chapter 15, verse 22, to chapter 16, verse 36, uh, we see what happens when the people of Israel, they continue their journey in the wilderness. On their way to the promised land, what happens? Friends, unfortunately, it does not take long for the people of Israel to forget God's goodness and to begin to complain. They forget the way God saved them at the Red Sea, and instead they grumble and complain because they have lack. And yet, again, because our God is kind, He provides for His people. As we study this passage together, that's really what we're going to focus our hearts on this morning. We're going to focus our hearts on God's kind provision. And again, I'm praying in particular that if you're someone that struggles with with that fear of, will there be enough? I'm praying that God's word will speak to you in a special way this morning, and you will see that our God will provide for his children all the way to heaven. So four truths about God's provision from Exodus 15, verse 22, to chapter 16, verse 36. If you have the bulletin that they were passing out as you came in, you'll have those notes there. Uh, but there will be four truths that we're going to talk about God's provision from this passage. The first truth is this, unbelief grumbles about God's provision unbelief grumbles about God's provision. We'll see that in chapter 15, verses 22 to 27. Second, we're going to see that God's provision is day by day. We'll see that in chapter 16, verses 1 to 20. Third, we're going to see that God's provision allows his people to rest. God's provision allows his people to rest. We'll see that in verse 21 to 30 of chapter 16. And fourth, God's provision lasts for a lifetime. God's provision lasts for a lifetime. We'll see that in chapter 16, verse 31 to verse 36. So let's look at that first truth together then. Unbelief grumbles about God's provision. That's really what you see in this passage, chapter 15, verses 22 to 27. The people of Israel, they're leaving the Red Sea now. 
but remember what they just experienced. Remember that God had just delivered them by mighty miracles from the land of Egypt. Remember that they had just seen the armies of Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. Now, looking at all that God had done for them, what you would expect to see is them continuing to walk and sing and praise God all day long for his goodness. But that's not what you see in these verses. Instead, you see this. You see how the people of Israel begin to react when they face a little adversity. And how do they react? Well, what's the adversity? It's a lack of water. Verse 22, the people of Israel, they leave the Red Sea. They travel for three days into the wilderness of Shur. It's a a difficult place. It's semi-arid. It's inhospitable. There's little vegetation. And for three days, the people realize that they're going without water, a little bit of water. Uh, Perhaps there was too much salt. Perhaps there were too many minerals. Perhaps even it was poisoned. We're not sure. Regardless, they could not drink the water. It was bitter. It couldn't be drunk. And so they called the area Mara, which means bitter in Hebrew. Now, what should the Israelites have done at this point? They've got this difficulty. They've got this adversity. They've just seen God's deliverance. God himself is going before them at a pillar of cloud and a pillar of fire guiding them through the wilderness. What should the people of Israel have done? Now, they should have cried out to God. Now, they should have asked him to provide water for them, but that's not what they do. Their first thought is not, let's go to God. Their first thought is... This isn't right. And so they start to grumble. What are we going to drink, they say in verse 24. And they're telling that to Moses. This is the first time that word grumble, complaining there, it's used in the Bible. But it's not going to be the last time. Actually, one of the the things that we're going to see as we study through Exodus and, and even in years in the future as we look at the rest of the first five books of the Bible, is that grumbling and complaining become a besetting sin of the people of Israel, something that characterizes them. But now look in verse 25, and look at the way that Moses responds. What does Moses do? Well, Moses doesn't grumble and complain. He turns to God. He cries out to God. There's faith there. And then what does the Lord do when Moses prays? Well, the Lord shows him a tree, and when he throws the tree into the water, the water is miraculously transformed so that they're able to drink it. God does a miracle. It's a gracious miracle. Even though the people of Israel, whom he's just delivered, were grumbling and complaining ultimately against him, he still provides for their needs. But notice that he did more than that. He also used the the healing, if you will, of the waters of Marah as something of an object lesson for the people to teach them that if they would obey his commands, uh, he would not inflict on them any of the illnesses that he had inflicted on the Egyptians. And what does that teach us about our God? It teaches us that our God is a healer. That's a wonderful truth. We love doctors, we love medicine, but we don't ultimately look to doctors or medicine or anything like that. We ultimately look to God because God is the one who heals his people. Then in verse 27, we see that the people of Israel traveled on to Elim. And here, after this place of difficulty, God in his kindness, he gives them another blessing because this is an oasis. And there are, notice, there are 12 springs there. That's one for each tribe of Israel. And there are 70 date palms, and there's sweet fruit for the people to eat. Now, looking at these verses, verses 22 to 27, what should we take away? Let me make two observations before we move on. The first is this. The first kind of thing I want us to notice is that first truth, that unbelief grumbles about God's provision. That's really kind of the heart of what you see in this passage. Uh, Why were the people of Israel complaining to Moses? Why were they grumbling? Well, it was because of unbelief, wasn't it? They didn't trust God to provide. If they trusted that God was going to provide, there would have been no grumbling. There would have been no complaining. And again, remember that God had just rescued them from Pharaoh. They had seen that God is able to help them. God is, even at that moment, going before them in a pillar of cloud, guiding them. They should have cried out, but instead they doubted God, and their unbelieving hearts grumbled against God's provision. In Christ's fellowship, we can do the same thing, can't we? No, we need to be on guard against the sin in our own lives. After all, we're very much like the people of Israel. Like them, and we need to live our lives through this frame, we have received a great salvation. It's actually far greater than what the people of Israel received in being rescued from Egypt. We have been set free from our sins. Christ is our Savior. We stand before God perfectly accepted. We have been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. All of that is true. All of that is ours But don't we still grumble and complain? I wonder how your last week was. I wonder if you were characterized by giving thanks or if you were characterized by complaining. Why do we complain? 
when you think about it, the reason why we complain is it all comes down to this issue of unbelief. We complain because we don't believe ultimately deep down that God's going to provide for us. We're fearful, we're restless, and we give kind of vent to our inner anxieties by our grumbling and our complaining. Here's the thing, we trust God for heaven. All of us would say, yeah, I'm going to go to heaven because Jesus died for my sins. But we struggle so much to trust God for earth. We struggle with trusting that he's going to provide for us day by day all the way to heaven. Other times we complain because we doubt that God's provision will be good. Uh, And here's the problem. We think we know better than God what we need. And so when God doesn't give us what we want, what we think we need when we want it, how do we respond? Well, in unbelief, we grumble and complain. And I know that every single one of us in here has done that. Either way, whether we're doubting that God is going to provide or whether we doubt that God's provision is going to be good, we sin, we dishonor God, and it's an ugly thing. We need to understand as a church, and I think the Bible highlights this, that grumbling and complaining is not a little thing. It will literally destroy your life. It will make people not want to be around you. If all you do is grumble and complain day after day after day, it will literally just kind of shrink your soul down. And it also destroys churches. We'll talk about that a little bit more later. That's why the New Testament takes it so seriously. That's why the New Testament commands us to put away all grumbling. That's what it says in Philippians 2. Listen to the command here, verse 14 and 15. Do everything without grumbling and arguing so that you may be blameless and pure, children of God who are faultless in a crooked and perverted generation among whom you shine like stars in the world. Now, why does that command make sense? That command makes sense because we've received a far greater salvation than the people of Israel. That command makes sense because God is our Father. That command makes sense because right now, if you're in Christ, you are perfectly accepted and perfectly loved. That command makes sense because God, who is omnipotent, has promised to carry you safely all the way to heaven. So we never have to grumble. We never have to complain Instead, we can be a people who are marked by thanksgiving. There's something else we need to see from this passage, though. These verses, verse 22 to 27, our sinful hearts quickly forget God's blessings. That's what's going on in these verses. Now, just remember, just three days have passed since the Lord rescued them from the armies of Pharaoh. After that deliverance, they're singing on the side of the sea. They're praising God. But now three days have gone by, and they're thirsty. There's a little adversity and they forget God's goodness, and they begin to focus on their problems, and they give way to grumbling and complaining. And you know what? If we're not careful, the same thing can happen to us. So we've been celebrating, I think rightly this morning, this blessing of this new building that God has given us. Praise God for that. You know, many of us uh, had tears in our eyes last week as we were looking at the way God had provided for us. It's right for us to be joyful, but if we're not careful, we can forget that blessing, and we can begin to complain. So I wonder how we're going to respond after we move in. Will we respond with ongoing gratitude? Or will we begin grumbling and complaining the first time someone makes a decision about how to use the building that we don't like? Brothers and sisters, we can very much fall into this same sin. Our God has been good to us. So let's not not, um, give ourselves to grumbling. Let's not quickly forget God's blessings. Instead, let's be a congregation that gives thanks to God. So that's what you see when you look at verse 22 to 27. You see that unbelief grumbles about God's provision, and yet our God is kind. That brings us to our second truth. God's provision is day by day. Look at your copy of God's Word, verses 1 to 20. Let me read that for us, verse 1 to 20. God's provision is day by day. The entire Israelite community departed from Elim and came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai, on the 15th day of the second month after they had left the land of Egypt. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, you brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I'm going to rain bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. This way I will test them to see whether or not they will follow my instructions. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites, This evening you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you will see the Lord's glory, because he has heard your complaints about him. 
For who are we that you complain about us? Moses continued, The Lord will give you meat to eat this evening and all the bread you want in the morning, for he has heard the complaints that you are raising against him. Who are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. Then Moses told Aaron, Say to the entire Israelite community, Come before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. As Aaron was speaking to the entire Israelite community, they turned towards the wilderness. And there, in a cloud, the Lord's glory appeared. The Lord spoke to Moses, I have heard the complaints of the Israelites. Tell them, At twilight you will eat meat, and in the morning you will eat bread until you're full, and then you will know that I am the Lord your God. So at evening, quail came and covered the camp. In the morning, there was a layer of dew all around the camp. When the layer of dew evaporated, there were fine flakes on the desert surface, as fine as frost on the ground. When the Israelites saw it, they asked one another, what is it? Because they didn't know what it was. Moses told them, it is the bread the Lord has given you to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather as much of it as each person needs to eat. You may take two quarts per individual, according to the number of people each of you has in his tent. So the Israelites did this. Some gathered a lot, some a little. When they measured it by courts, the person who gathered a lot had no surplus, and the person who gathered a little had no shortage. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat. Moses said to them, No one is to let any of it remain until the morning. But they didn't listen to Moses. Some people left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. Therefore, Moses was angry with them. So here the people of Israel are carrying on in their journey. They leave the oasis at Elim, and they enter the wilderness of Sin, which was between Elim and Sinai. Now, it had been 30 days since they had left Egypt at this point, and they didn't have time to prepare, as you remember, for a long journey. And so now their supplies are running low. They're running out of food. How do they respond? Well, they cry out to God, trusting him for provision, right? No, again, they grumbled. And this time, notice, this time they grumble against Moses and Aaron, all the leadership. And notice that it wasn't only a few of the Israelites who complained. Notice in verse 2, look at what it says. The entire Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And look at their complaint in verse 3. This really should stagger us. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt when we sat by pots of meat and ate all the bread we wanted. Instead, You brought us into this wilderness to make this whole assembly die of hunger. Now, 30 days before that, they had seen God rescue them, and they praised his name as they left Egypt. And before that, back in chapter 2 of Exodus, remember what they were doing? They were crying out to the Lord to rescue them because of the oppression of Pharaoh. But now what are they doing? Now they're crying out against the Lord. And they're saying it would have been far better for them to have stayed in Egypt Actually, they say they wish that Yahweh would have killed them because it was better for them, apparently, than to go a few days without food. This is more than grumbling. This is really open rebellion against the Lord. That's what this is. It's also a reminder to us that grumbling and complaining spreads. You know, you can see that in a a home. Someone starts complaining in the home, and it just kind of goes and goes all the way through. The same thing happens in churches as well. This sin of grumbling and complaining had had happened, it had occurred, it had spread all the way through the people of Israel. Well, looking at verse 4 to 5, we see how the Lord responds. Notice in those verses that once again, God is gracious. He tells the people that he's going to feed them bread from heaven. So in the wilderness, there's no food, but that's no problem for God. At any moment, he can open the windows of heaven. He can provide for day. But then on the sixth day, they're to gather more than enough. They're going to gather enough for two days. And then in verse 6 to 8, Moses and Aaron tell the people God's plan. They say that they're going to see God's glory displayed in the way that he provides for their needs. But then notice what they do in verse 10. They also confront the people with the fact that their grumbling and complaining is ultimately against God. In Christ's fellowship, this is an important principle. If we want to put the grumbling and complainings in our life to death, this will help us do it. If we realize that every time I grumble about, oh, my job or my spouse, or my children, or my health. I'm ultimately grumbling against God because who's in control of every aspect of my life? Who's sovereign over everything that occurs to me? God is. So when I'm grumbling, when I'm complaining, what I'm ultimately doing is I'm looking to God and I'm saying, God, you're not good, and your provision for me is not good. Now, here's the thing. If you're in Christ, you love God. Uh, he's put that love for him in your heart. Now, now, let's let that reality that everything we have has been given to us by God, let's let that truth put
put grumbling and complaining in our life to death. We can trust God. And you see that in this passage. So verses 9 to 20 just kind of highlights the way that God is faithful. In verse 9, Moses tells the people to turn so that they can see the glory of the Lord there in the, in the, the pillar of cloud. This is the Shekinah glory of God. It's just kind of a visible manifestation of his presence. So they know the Lord is with them. And then the Lord spoke to Moses and told him that the people would eat until they were full that evening. I love that God is not stingy with his provision. He's generous with his provision. And that's what happened. The Lord miraculously brings quail, these birds, into the camp. And they're able to eat all that evening. And they go to sleep. And they get up the next morning. And there are fine flakes all over the ground, things that they've never seen before. And they don't know what it is. But Moses explains to them that this is heavenly bread and that they were to take two quarts per person each day. And then notice what happens. When the people obey God, and they take only what they're supposed to, they all have enough. No one has any lack. But when they try to gather more than they needed, what happens? Uh, Begins to stink, begins to rot. God wants them to learn something. God wants them to learn this, that his provision is day by day. That God intends to provide for his people day by day. That's really the main thing you see in these verses, that God is a God who provides for his people day by day. So as the people of Israel travel to the promised land, even though it took them 40 years, every day God opens the windows of heaven, as it were, and he showers down food for them so that they can eat and be satisfied. Here's the question. Why did God do it that way? He could have performed a miracle, He could have just made them not be hungry for 40 years and not be thirsty for 40 years. He could have supplied them from his own fullness in that way. And yet he chose to provide for them daily. Why? We actually don't have to wonder. Actually, the Bible tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 8, Moses explains to the people why God chose to provide for them with the manna in this way. Deuteronomy 8 verse 3, Moses says, He humbled you by letting you go hungry. And then he gave you manna to eat, which you and your father had not known, so that you might learn that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. So the Lord chose to provide for the people of Israel day by day to do two things, to humble them, but then also to teach them this, that they needed to depend upon him for everything. He wanted them to learn that their greatest need wasn't for food, but it was for him. And What God did with manna, Christ's fellowship, to apply it to us, he does the same thing with us in regards to his grace. He provided them with manna day by day to sustain their lives. You know what he does? Day by day, he provides us with grace so that he sustains us so that we can live for him. Isn't it true that we grow weary of our spiritual weakness? Wouldn't it be great? You kind of feel like if I could just have enough spiritual strength just from myself to live for God and to do a good job on my own, Wouldn't that be great? But actually, no, God sees it best for us to be dependent upon him and to lean upon him day after day for grace to live for him. Why does God do that? God lets us see our our weakness for this reason, because it keeps us humble. And God makes us come to him day by day for this reason, because it keeps us dependent upon him. And in this way, God receives all the glory. So what do we need to do? Day by day, we need to seek God for grace. We do that as we spend time with God in his word. We do that as we spend time with God in prayer. We come into his presence and we ask him to provide for us day by day. And that's the second truth. There's a third truth. God's provision allows his people to rest. Look at verse 21 to 30. God's provision allows his people to rest. They gathered it every morning. Each gathered as much as he needed to eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. On the sixth day, they gathered twice as much food, four quarts apiece, and all the leaders of the community came and reported this to Moses, and he told them, this is what the Lord has said, today is a day of complete rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you want to bake, and boil what you want to boil, and set aside everything left over to be kept until morning. So they set it aside until morning, as Moses commanded, and it didn't stink or have maggots in it. Eat it today, Moses said, because today is a Sabbath to the Lord. Today you won't find any in the field." For six days you will gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. Yet on the seventh day, some of the people went out to gather, but they didn't find any. Then the Lord said to Moses, How long will you refuse to keep my commands and instructions? Understand that the Lord has given you the Sabbath. Therefore, on the sixth day, he will give you two days worth of bread. Each of you stay where you are. 
No one is to leave his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. What is God doing for his people in this passage? God is giving them a gift. He's giving them the gift of rest. Keep in mind that as slaves under Pharaoh, they would have never had a regular day of rest. Instead, they would have grown up their entire lives under the lash of Pharaoh and his Egyptian overlords, serving him day after day, seven days a week. That was what it was like to serve Pharaoh. But now Yahweh, the true God, is showing them what it's going to be like to serve him. And because he's gracious, that service will be different. He's going to provide for them in such a way that they're going to have a weekly day of rest. And that's what you see in this passage. Uh, That's why they were supposed to gather manna, two quarts per person, Sunday to Thursday. But on Friday, they were to go out and they were to gather twice as much because they were going to need some for the Sabbath, but they weren't supposed to work on the Sabbath. Instead, they were supposed to rest. And in verse 23, Moses explains to the people that the Sabbath would be a day of complete rest. It would be a day of worship. It would be a holy Sabbath to the Lord. And so they were to bake everything that they needed for the Sabbath the day before. They were put it into cakes and bread and whatever they wanted because they weren't to work on the Sabbath. But then God would, in a miraculous provision, he would keep that fresh an extra day so that it would not rot. And how did the people respond? Well, many of the people, they obeyed. But you know, others doubted, and they went out on the seventh day. Why did they go out on the seventh day? They didn't trust God to provide. They didn't trust God to preserve the food. And so in verse 28 to 30, the Lord rebukes the people. How long will you refuse to keep my commands and and instructions? And this is really the, the same rebuke that he'd actually said to Pharaoh back in Exodus 10. How long will you refuse to obey my commands and let the people of Israel go? Some of the Israelites were just as hard-hearted as Pharaoh. But after this rebuke, the people began to obey. Now, there's a lot that we could say from these verses, but I want us to focus on this third truth. God's provision allows his people to rest. And some of us struggle here. We talked about this at the beginning of the service. Some of us really struggle with the idea of, will I have enough? Will that day come someday in the future when All my fears are going to be realized, and we're not going to have enough money. We're not going to have a home. We're not going to have a car. We're not going to have enough. And so what do we do? We struggle with anxious thoughts, and we look at our bank accounts, and we worry. And we look at our retirement savings, and we worry. And day by day, we're stressed and we're afraid because that day may come someday when we don't have enough And so we scurry around like a bunch of frenzied ants whose mound has just been kicked over. And we store up and we strategize and we plan and we hope against hope that we will someday have peace in our hearts. That someday when we look at what we've stored up, that someday it will be enough. And friends, listen, it's vain. It will never be enough. It doesn't matter how much we store up. It doesn't matter how much our our bank accounts are. It doesn't matter how much we hoard. It will never be enough to give us peace in our hearts. And this is a big deal because everyone everyone knows. You can look at the news. You see the, the economy seems to be weakening. There's inflation. And there are continual doomsday prophecies out there about how the economy is going to collapse. And if you spend your days watching the news, I can tell you you're going to be depressed and you're going to be anxious because that's their business, is making you afraid. That's what they do. And making you worried, so you keep watching and hoping that you'll have good news. And they monetize that. And you know what? We have a better resource. We don't have to be afraid. Why? Because God's provision allows his people to rest. That's what you see here. Day by day, he's providing for them. But then on the sixth day, he kind of tests them a little bit more and says, now store up enough for two days because I'm going to make that last. I'm going to provide for you. So what should we do when we look at the way that God provided for his people week after week for 40 years? What should we do? Well, we should repent of our restlessness. God provides for his people. He will provide for us all the way to heaven so we can rest in him. And that's why Meredith read what she did for us from Matthew 6, verse 25 to 34. Just listen again to the way Jesus reasons here about God's care for his people and the way that God provides for his people. And this is where we find rest. 
Listen again. Therefore, I tell you, Jesus says, don't worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink or about your body, what you will wear. Isn't life more than food and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or reap or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment of his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you, not even Solomon in all of his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you, you of little faith? So don't worry saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow because tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Now, Christ Fellowship, what would happen in our hearts if we took Jesus at his word? Wouldn't we be able to rest? If I really believe God is my father and he's going to clothe me and he's going to feed me and he knows what I need, if I really rested in his character, wouldn't I be able to rest? And brothers and sisters... We can trust God and we can rest because he's good. He'll provide for all of our needs. So let's rest in him. Now, more briefly, a fourth truth this morning. God's provision will last a lifetime. Look at verse 31 to 36. The house of Israel named the substance manna. It resembled coriander seed, was white and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Two quarts of it are to be preserved throughout your generation so that they may see the bread I fed you in the wilderness when I brought you out of the land of Egypt. Moses told Aaron, take a container and put two quarts of manna in it. Then place it before the Lord to be preserved throughout your generations. As the Lord commanded Moses, Aaron placed it before the testimony to be preserved. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they reached the border of the land of Canaan. They used a measure called an omer, which held two quarts. So verse 31 to 36 wraps up this section where the the Lord is telling us about manna and his provision of manna for the people of Israel. And in verse 31 to 34, he commands the people to take two quarts, that's a, a day's provision for a man or a woman, and to set it aside in a container and to keep it, why? As a testimony to the fact that God provided for his people in the wilderness. But then look at verse 35, you read this note. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to an inhabited land. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. And Joshua 5 verse 12 lets us know that God continued to rain down manna day by day for 40 years until they entered into the promised land where they began to eat the produce of the land. And so they never went without what they needed all the way to the promised land. And what should we brothers and sisters learn from this we should learn that God's provision will last a lifetime. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 10 reminds us that the things that happened to the people of Israel in the wilderness, both the good and the bad, were written down for our instruction because the Christian life follows the shape of Israel, the pattern of Israel. So think about it. Israel was enslaved to Pharaoh, and we were enslaved to our sins. Israel was set free from their bondage to Pharaoh. They were redeemed and delivered. We have been set free from our sins. We have been redeemed and delivered. Israel had to go through the wilderness for 40 years in order to make it to the promised land. And we are even now passing through the wilderness of this world on the way to the true promised land, which is heaven. And how long did the manna continue to fall for? All the way to the promised land. And how long will God continue to provide for his people? All the way to heaven. Praise God. Praise God. Will God continue to provide for us? Yes, all the way. You know, if you doubt that, you can talk to any of our senior saints and ask them what it's been like to walk with the Lord for decades. So I think of of some of these, Diana Finger and Carolyn Robertson and Judy Hartman and Glenn Horner, and there are others. And you can just ask them to tell you stories about the way that God has provided for them over the years. And I've had the privilege of hearing some of those stories of the ways that God has been so faithful to provide for them. 
And they will encourage you that God will provide for you as well, that God cares for his people all the way to heaven. But now having a look at this passage, I don't want us to leave manna behind without understanding the true significance of manna. What is this ultimately pointing us to, right? We've talked about how God provided the people of Israel with manna, but I want us to understand what the manna ultimately signified. Again, the pattern of Israel is written for our instruction so that we have understanding. And manna, listen, brothers and sisters, was more than just heavenly food. It was a type of Christ. It was a picture pointing ahead to something greater than itself, pointing ahead ultimately to Jesus. And who is Jesus? Brothers and sisters, Jesus is the true bread of heaven. He's the living bread. That's what Jesus himself taught in John 6. So shortly after he fed 5,000 men and their families, a vast multitude, they come looking for Jesus. Now, why are they looking for Jesus? Well, because they realize that this man is able to feed them every single day. And so they think that if they can come to Jesus, they're going to catch a ride on the gravy train for the rest of their life, and they're never going to go hungry. But Jesus knew that they were missing the point. So what did he do? Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to John 6, and I want you to look at verse 47 to 51, John 6, verse 47 to 51, because here Jesus uh, explained the significance of manna to them, and I want us to understand the significance of manna this morning and, and what it means for us. So John 6, verse 47 to 51. Kind of look up at me when you've got it, so I know that you're with me. John 6, good, 47 to 51. Here's where Jesus explains to them the true significance of manna. Jesus says, truly I tell you, anyone who believes has eternal life, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that anyone may eat it and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. When Jesus says that he's the living bread that comes down from heaven, he's telling this vast multitude in his day and he's telling us in our own day not to be focused on satisfying your hunger with the passing things of this life that don't last. Instead, Focus on him. You see, the manna that Moses gave the people in the wilderness was ultimately physical bread. It only sustained them for a time, but they ultimately died. All the Israelites who ate manna in the wilderness, they died. But Jesus is living bread, and and he's saying all who eat of him will live forever. Well, manna was an amazing miracle of God that we study this morning But the true significance is found in that. It's found in Jesus, the bread of heaven. And here's why. Pay attention to this. If you hear nothing else this morning, this is the way to receive eternal life. It is to believe in Jesus. It is to feed upon Christ by faith. It is to put your hope in Jesus this morning, and he will give you eternal life. So what about you? Have you eaten of the bread of heaven? Have you put your trust in Christ for eternal life? Have you turned from your sins and followed him? Friend, listen, if you're here this morning and you're just checking out Christianity, we want you to understand that you're just like us. You were born with the same spiritual problem that we were born with, that you were born separated from God. You were created by him to know him and to worship him. He was to be the source of life and light in your life, but Just like us, you were born kind of turned in on yourself, and so what felt natural was not to worship God, but to focus on what you wanted and to serve and to go your own way, looking out for your own interests. And the Bible says that that is ultimately rebellion against God, and ultimately that that is serious, that God takes our rebellion against him seriously. And if you were to die and stand before God still in your sins, if you haven't been forgiven of your sins... The Bible says there's no way that you will be accepted by God. You have to understand that Christianity is it's not a religion that says, try harder and read the Bible and be kind and go to church and you're going to be okay. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches none of us are okay. The Bible teaches all of us have a great need. We all need life to be given to us. Where are we going to find that life? Friends, we find it in Jesus. That's why Jesus came into the world. That's why the bread of heaven came down into this world. He came to live a perfect life, the kind of life that you and I have failed to live. 
He always walked in obedience to the will of his heavenly father. And he came with a mission. And the mission was to give himself for the world to offer himself as a sacrifice. And he died on the cross intentionally laying down his life in the place of his people, in the place of all who will turn from their sins and trust in him. And this is the way to find life in Jesus. Turn from your sins this morning. Turn from living for yourself and seeking your own way and instead look to him by faith and put your hope in him and what he did. Begin to feed on Christ by faith this morning and you will be saved. And that means that all of your sins will be forgiven. We don't have much to offer to you at Christ Fellowship, but we do have that. We have Jesus and he's everything. He's everything. And that's what we offer to you this morning is that if you will today put your trust in Jesus, feed on Christ by faith, all of your sins will be forgiven. And you'll be reconciled and restored to God. And friend, you're sitting in a group of people that that's our testimony, that God has done that for us. And our prayer is that he would do that for you today as you look to him by faith. So Christ Fellowship, we've seen a lot this morning as we looked at this passage. We've seen God's kind provision. We've seen the way that God gave the people of Israel water to drink and manna to eat, and he did that every day, day by day for 40 years. But Christ Fellowship, that's what God has done for us as well. He's given us Jesus so that day by day we will receive fresh grace from him all the way to heaven. He will provide for all of our needs. He's worthy to be praised. And let's pray. Lord God, we do praise you this morning for the provision that we have received in Christ. We thank you that he is the bread of heaven. Oh, I pray, that, I pray that those here who do not know you would understand what it means that the very Son of God came into this world to give his life for sinners so that we might be forgiven. I pray that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, I pray for us as a church that we would remember that our God is a faithful provider. Lord, that you are a faithful provider so that we would be characterized not by grumbling and complaining, but by continual thanks as we seek to live for you. And we pray that you would do this to the praise of your name. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, praise God for his word. And we have the wonderful opportunity this morning of celebrating the baptism of our brother B.J. Schnowski. Uh, he's here to be baptized this morning, and that's a great, wonderful thing. We're going to have you come up in just a minute, BJ. Let me just give you a word about what baptism is, what it is that you're going to see this morning. Baptism is a, an ordinance or a command of the Lord. It's something that the Lord has given the church. It's a way of marking off those who follow Jesus. So baptism is something that the church does. Uh, the church, by baptizing someone, is saying, we believe uh, that this person is a genuine follower of Christ, he professes the right gospel, and his life gives evidence, or her life gives evidence of the fact that they are truly following Jesus. And by being baptized, the person is saying, I'm with Jesus. I've turned from my sins, and I put my trust in Christ, and Christ alone for salvation, and I'm going to follow him all the way to heaven. Jesus commanded his followers that we're to go into the world, and we're to make disciples, make followers of Jesus, and we're to baptize them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we see this happen all throughout the Bible, all throughout the New Testament. We see men and women, as they come and put their faith in Jesus, they are baptized and welcomed into the church. The clearest place or the clearest passage where we see the significance of baptism is found in Romans 6, verse 3 and 4, which says, Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. So the one who is being baptized is saying that, that he's been united to Christ, that he's died to his old life, to who he used to be, and now he's walking in newness of life following Jesus. So baptism is, brothers and sisters, a picture of the gospel. It's a picture of the salvation that we've received in Christ, and we have the privilege of seeing that picture this morning. So I'm going to ask BJ if you'd come. This is BJ Schnowski. Good brother. And PJ, BJ is going to share his testimony with us uh, and why he wants to be baptized. Good morning. Can you guys hear me in back? Good morning, Christ Fellowship. For those of you that don't know me, I'm BJ Schnowski. My family and I have been attending for four years, and I'm excited to be baptized as a believer this morning amongst my church family. 
I was very blessed to be raised by a family, a loving family and a Christian home. While I participated in many religious activities as a child, I didn't accept Christ into my heart until my senior year of high school. I had often heard growing up that Christ had died for our sins or that his blood was shed for our salvation. But up until that point, they were just words. I understood them to be true because adults that I trusted said them, but I never examined their significance or how they applied to me. Then finally sunk in. I was a sinful person who could never be good enough to earn my way into heaven. The only way to wipe away my sins was a perfect atonement, and that was Jesus. He bore the price for my sins on the cross. He died so that my sins could be forgiven. When the magnitude of this sacrifice finally sunk in, I realized that Jesus has died to pay the penalty for my sins, and I gave my life to Christ. I would like to say that my journey since that point has been straightforward, but I fell away from the Lord during my early college years. Later on, I was blessed to be invited to a Bible study by a group of friends. Their passion for Christ and zeal for understanding his word was inspiring. My wife was one of those friends, and I've been very blessed that she challenges me in a daily walk with Christ. We found the same passion here at Christ Fellowship, and I'm excited to be, I'm excited to be pub publicly demonstrate my faith in our risen Savior in death to sin and resurrection to new life through baptism. Thank you. Major, I'll have you stand here just for a minute. Two questions that we ask all that we baptize in the church. Do you make a profession of repentance towards God and faith in Jesus Christ? I do. Amen. Do you promise by God's grace to follow him forever in the fellowship of his church? I do. I do. Amen. Brother, thank you. Uh, go be changed, and we're going to have the musicians if they'd come, and they're going to lead us in a song while BJ is getting ready to be baptized, and then when he comes back out, we will baptize him and continue. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing Amazing Grace.
It's a wonderful hymn. Please be seated. BJ, based on your profession of faith in Christ, your love for God, and your desire to follow him all your days, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand and let's conclude our service by singing the last verse of Amazing Grace. continue to stand. Let's conclude our service as we say our benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Please be seated. Use the next few moments to think about what you've heard this morning, to pray, prepare your heart to go into this next week serving the Lord Jesus. And I'll conclude the service with an amen in just a moment. Amen.